Hey everybody, my name is Marty Kessler for BibleTalk.tv. And this is the first in what is presently a four-lesson series entitled, Things You Probably Did Not Learn in School. And the question is, for this first lesson, did dinosaurs and people ever live together? The obvious implications of Scripture are that they did. But the question follows, what evidence is there for their coexistence outside of the Bible? You be the judge. Based on the Bible's account of both creation and the flood, we should expect that dinosaurs and men were contemporaries. Uh, we're continually told that dinosaurs went extinct millions of years ago. Since both claims cannot be true, I'm asking you to consider the following evidence for the relatively recent coexistence of dinosaurs with man. And let's start with the legends. Abounding in the histories of many peoples are accounts of lizard-like beasts. And the existence of such creatures has been recorded by explorers, historians, scholars, and even kings and saints. Dragons is the word because prior to 1841, there was no word such as dinosaur. Sir Richard Owen coined the word dinosaur, which incidentally means terrible lizards. And before that time, dinosaurs would have been called dragons. Incidentally, uh, though dinosaurs is a cool word, I think dragons is cooler, but that's an argument for a different day. The issue is that accounts of dragons are abundant in the histories of many people, and that's what we're looking at. Who has accounts of dragons? Well, we can start with China and Japan. Those are two nations famous for their dragons. And then their neighbor, Nepal, just to the west of China, is also a nation fraught with legends of dinosaur-like creatures or dragons. The Pacific Islanders have such accounts. So do those in Australia, the Aboriginal people there, the African tribes uh, in, a, in a completely different continent. North American Indian tribes on the continent of North America, obviously, and South American cultures have accounts of dinosaur-like creatures. Those people in Egypt, the ancient ones there, wrote about them. Ethiopia, Persia, India, Russia, and Europe. And more specifically in Europe, England, France, Ireland, Switzerland, Scandinavia, Germany, Italy, and Greece. All these nations, all these cultures, all these peoples have legends of beasts that were either dinosaurs or very much like dinosaurs. It's abundant, it's prolific, it's all over the globe. Let's start in North America with the Native Americans that we know as the Ojibwa people. They had a, an animal they called the Unktehi. He's depicted here on the Agawa Rock in Mishapezu, Lake Superior Provincial Park. I'm not sure if I pronounced those words right, those names right. At any rate, that's in Ontario, Canada. And this animal was known to them, but also it was known to the Sioux of the Northern Plains. You see this depiction here, a large creature, if the scale is in any way accurate. That must be a canoe with about five warriors in it. And there's some pretty large snakes pictured there with it. But why in the world would they draw such a creature if they hadn't seen something like that? Henry Rowe Schoolcraft, he was a geologist and an Indian agent. And he wrote extensively about the Sioux Indians. And he recorded images like the ones we saw the Ojibwa had made, as well as accounts of the creatures. These two drawings to the left are reproduced from about an 1850 a set of pictures made by Sioux Indians on birch bark. And I want you to notice their similarity to a, this depiction of an Ankylosaurus. So again, we've got the Ojibwa Indians, we've got the Sioux Indians drawing similar pictures of creatures that must have existed, and those creatures, whatever they drew, were very much like an Ankylosaurus. Were they seeing an Ankylosaurus? How did the Ojibwa, how did the Sioux, make such accurate drawings if they had not seen one? That would be the question. Further west from the Sioux and the Ojibwa were the Anasazi Indians, and they left depictions, or at least this depiction, of what appears to be a sauropod dinosaur. This carving is found at the Kachina Bridge in the Natural Bridge Monument of Utah. And also in this area, they found a picture of an ibex and another picture that resembles a woolly mammoth. The remains of both of these animals, the ibex and the mammoth, have been found in that region though the animals themselves have not been present for many years as far as we know. But also the remains of sauropods are also found. So if they drew the ibex and we assume they saw the ibex and they drew the mammoth and we assume they saw the mammoth, why would we not assume that they had seen the sauropod since they drew a sauropod? It's a question I think worthy of consideration. 
more Native American dinosaur drawings. Uh, perhaps these were from the Anasazi as well. At any rate, these are uh, from New Mexico. This petroglyph, it was discovered in 2012 near Hidden Mountain just outside of Los Lunas, New Mexico. It's on an isolated, almost accessible ledge, and it is also near a very clear deer petroglyph. In other words, these folks were etching out pictures of animals that they had seen. We would naturally think they had seen a deer as the Anasazi would have seen an ibex or a mammoth. And so when you see this depiction, we wonder what in the world is this? And surely they must have seen it along with the other creatures that they uh, etched in stone. So was this ancient artist drawing a Sorolophus? That's what it looks like. There are other dinosaurs similar to the Sorolophus that it might have been, but it's very definitely dinosauric, if you will. And why would they draw such a picture? Why would they etch such a picture? Why would they go to the pains and the, uh, exert the energy to do this if they had not seen such an animal? Who etched into the wall of the Grand Canyon what appears to be an Edmontosaurus? I mean, if you were going to make up a dinosaur, make up a creature, make up a... Uh, a a fantastic animal to draw, would you draw that? But if you had seen one on the other hand, why wouldn't you draw it? They seem to draw pictures of lots of animals that they encountered. This picture, this etching, was discovered by Samuel Hubbard, who was an evolutionist. He discovered it in the late 1800s, and the picture itself, the etching itself, is about 11 inches by 9 inches. So how did the artist reproduce the image so accurately? Had he seen an Edmontosaurus? It certainly seems like he would have to have gotten the picture so accurate. And fossil remains of those creatures have been found in the area. And it's interesting that Samuel Hubbard discovered this, and he, being an evolutionist, had this to say. He said, the fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all the theories regarding the antiquity of man. Facts are stubborn and immutable things. If theories do not square with the facts, then the theories must change. The facts remain. Again, that's from Mr. Hubbard, who was himself an evolutionist. Other Native American tribes have depicted dinosaurs in their pottery and in other artifacts. But this piece was left by the Mississippian culture, which would have dated about 800 to 1500 A.D., or Common Era, if you will. What animal could this piece of art represent if not a sauropod dino? The swirl on there, we're told, most likely represents water, and that makes sense to me, probably does to you as well. And we often associate sauropod dinosaurs with water, or creatures that live in or near water. And perhaps that's exactly what this piece of pottery was depicting, a sauropod dinosaur with the image of water so that we could relate that that's where it lived. Here's another piece of pottery. This one made by the Mississippi Caddo Indians around 1200 A.D., is that not an image of a dinosaur fashioned as a handle? It certainly looks like it to me. I don't know what else it could be if not that. And the question is, how did early Native Americans know how to accurately depict such animals if they had not seen them? That's the question that keeps coming up. How about the Eleni Indians of Illinois? If you ever wonder where Illinois got its name, it must have been from the Eleni Indians. These Native people tell the legend of Piasa, meaning bird that devours man. This bird lived in a cave and it killed many people. Piazza was supposedly killed by a young man with a bow and arrow after the creature had killed his family. Now this is from Illinois. The Pima Indians of southern Arizona have a similar story. Uh, the report from Spanish explorer Captain Juan Mateo Manji with the Jesuits Eusebio Francisco Quino and Adamo Gil. By the way, notice that we've got the names of people, historic people, who had been sent out to, to do research and to explore. They're the ones, credible accounts, that they're reporting, giving to us about these Indian legends. The Pima people gave accounts to these men of two great flying monsters that ate people, very similar to the account by the Eleni Indians on the other side of North America. One of these creatures was asphyxiated when the Indians built a fire at the mouth of its cave, and the other was killed in a similar fashion after it had inhabited a pueblo. Now, the Yaqui Indians of southern Arizona also have a similar account. So we've got the Pima Indians, the Yaqui Indians, and the Eleni Indians all having accounts, stories about these great flying creatures that ate people with which they had to contend. Interesting. 
You got to wonder, did they see a, a Quetzalcoatlus, the largest pterosaur? Are similar accounts and descriptions nothing more than mere coincidence? Did they just fabricate these stories? Did they get spread around? Did they just make this up and happen to make up a story about a creature whose remains are found in those areas? Take a look at that chart and see the size of that creature. That animal existed. We know it existed. And it's very much like what they describe and could have easily been uh, the animal that they were talking about. Here are some figurines, many of which have been discovered. 33,000 of them have been discovered. And about 26,000 or 2,600 of them rather are like dinosaur, uh, dinosaur-like creatures. These were discovered in 1945 by Valdemir Julesrud in a place called Acambaro, Mexico. Uncovered these and many people have tried to discredit their authenticity, but their attempts to discredit them have failed. So how did the people in Mexico know how to accurately depict these dinosaur figures? How did they know what dinosaurs looked like and how they would pose themselves? But there are 2,600 dinosaur-like figurines in Acambaro, Mexico that have been unearthed. That's a lot of them. Also, some of these figurines have dermal spines and they have their tails held aloft. These are details about dinosaur anatomy and posture that we did not know until the late 20th century. And yet, whoever had buried these by 1945, and probably long before 1945, knew exactly what these creatures looked like and depicted them with dermal spines and their heads and tails held aloft. Here's a, an Ica ceremonial burial stone found in Peru from the Nazca culture from about 100 to 1800 AD. And these stones, there's a bunch of them, and they have so many dinosaurs depicted on them. If you'll take a look at this one, it looks like there's a, a man riding on top of a, a sauropod dinosaur trying to kill it with a spear while there are a couple of other dinosaurs, one above his head and one behind his back, who are attacking him. Interesting that they were able to draw these animals so accurately, to etch them into this stone. And there are many such stones. And again, we come back to the dermal spines. These stones also depict dermal spines. And we didn't know that dermal spines existed on dinosaurs until late in the 20th century. And here's a quote. Another discovery of dermal spines reveals a new look for sauropod dinosaurs. That wasn't about the stones, but the stones were telling the story before this had been put into this article. There's about 11,000 such stones that are extant. Extant simply means that they exist. There's some place where you can go and look at them. You can put your hands on them. They picture a wide variety of dinosaurs as this stone does. How many dinosaurs can you count? Most any sixth grader could probably name a bunch of them. Well, it looks like a Triceratops, and maybe a Dimetrodon as a sauropod dinosaur, maybe a an Apatosaurus or a Brachiosaurus, who knows, a ah, Stegosaurus in the back. Yeah, there's plenty of dinosaurs on here. How did they know how to etch these animals so accurately? That's the question we keep coming back to of all these people all over the world making pictures of dinosaurs in ancient times with accuracy and detail. Interesting. St. George, you ever heard of St. George killing the dragon? It's a story that's been relegated to myth and legend, but nearly all ancient depictions show the dragon this size or similar, which to me is significant. I mean, if you were making up a story about somebody killing a dragon, wouldn't you make the dragon big and tall and, and really fearsome? But instead, you've got this animal that looks like kind of a, a glorified crocodile. I think if I was going to make up a dragon, I could do a better job than that. And yet the early depictions of the dragon that St. George killed are all very much like this one here. Early depictions are making creatures similar to this guy who was Anothosaurus, whose fossils are found in the area where St. George is said to have killed the dragon. Isn't that interesting? So we've got this animal, fossilized remains of it, in a place where George killed the dragon that he supposedly killed. And here's the comparative size of the Anothosaurus. We've got this chart showing about what an adult would have looked like, which is interestingly enough about what is pictured in the early depictions of George killing the dragon. Not some great tall giant beast, but this animal who actually did live in that area. Looks about right, doesn't it? When you look at the scale, you take a look at the size of that animal as compared to the drawing of the man, and then you look at George there on his horse, 
And there's the dragon and there's the damsel he's rescuing. It's not just a great story. It appears to be history. And there is a great deal of evidence to support that. How about English dragons? You see in this picture on the tomb of Bishop Richard Bell, depictions on brass inlays of all kinds of creatures, a dog, a pig, weasel, other such animals. But in addition to these normal animals, we have depictions of what appear to be two sauropods and, and then another crocodilian shaped dinosaur. And he was laid to rest in 1496. So these engravings on his tomb are from 1496. How did they know to depict these animals so accurately? It's very interesting. How did the engravers know how to accurately depict sauropods both anatomically and according to their posture, which we've not understood until recently to be with heads and tails held aloft and held horizontally? But they knew that, and that's how they put them in that brass. There's a lady by the name of Jacqueline Simpson, and she mentioned in her book, British Dragons, which she wrote in 1980, that over 70 villages in Great Britain have legends and traditions involving local dragons. Where would all that information come from if there wasn't something to it? That's the question. A lot of French chateaus. Here are a couple of depictions of what are on French chateaus from the Middle Ages, about the 1500s. They're decorated with salamanders. These are creatures that they say breathed fire. And these carvings are abundant. They're all over the chateaus in France. And in that same area, we see remains of this fella, the Baryonyx. His remains are found throughout Europe. Is it just a coincidence? And it's interesting. They put these pictures on their chateaus to protect their chateaus from fire because this creature, they said, breathed fire itself. And so with the idea of putting the fire-breathing creature on their homes, on their chateaus, they were protecting them from fire. That's what they believed. Why would they believe that? And how could they depict this animal so accurately if they hadn't seen one? Mesopotamia, that's the area of Iraq, Iran, Syria, Turkey. This area has produced this artifact. It's been found there. It's a jasper cylinder seal from the Uruk period, which is about 3500 BC in Mesopotamia. It's currently housed at the Louvre. So you can go to the Louvre and see it. I don't know if they let you see it, but it's there. That's the point. These are artifacts that are in existence. They've not been imagined or created or made up. They really exist and they depict these animals accurately. There's a striking similarity between the beasts that are depicted on that seal and an apatosaurus. You can see an artist's conception of an apatosaurus right there. So are we just supposed to believe that this is all coincidence, that the artist guessed right? You remember there was an apatosaurus or an animal like an apatosaurus etched on the wall of the Grand Canyon or uh, uh, in, in Arizona. We, we saw that earlier. Now we've got them here. We've got them on engraved on tombs in England. They're all over the place. How did people in so many different places and at so many different times know how to accurately depict these same creatures? It's a question worth considering. More dragons. This time we got dragons from Israel. And what in the world are these dinosaur-like creatures depicted on this ancient synagogue in the Umm el Katir uh, district in what's now the Golan Heights? How did the artists know? We keep coming back to that question. Why would they make such creatures if they were simply fanciful? And how would they depict them accurately to what we know dinosaurs did look like? Unless, of course, they had seen those animals. And dragons do figure prominently in Jewish scripture. We've got the Leviathan mentioned in Job chapter 3, and verse 8, Psalm 104, 26, and also the Isaiah the prophet talked about Leviathan in chapter 27, verse 1. At the flying serpents of Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 29, and chapter 30, verse 6. We've got the behemoth. Uh, by the way, with the behemoth, the Leviathan is also mentioned. We can come back to him. But the behemoth in particular is mentioned in great detail as having a, a tree that's, or a, a tail that swings like a cedar, a great, and, and bones like bronze. And he is said to be in the water in Job chapter 40. And he's not afraid of the floods. Reminiscent of that uh, pottery piece that the Mississippi Caddo Indians made with the, the sauropod looking dinosaur and the swirling of water perhaps is, is what that showed. And then you've got the great dragon of the Revelation. So there are a lot of dragons, a lot of great beasts like dinosaurs in the literature of the Jewish people. 
Chinese dragons, of course. Everybody knows about Chinese dragons. China's proliferated with dragon legends. It's, is it simply a coincidence that China has so many legends, but is also having so many dinosaur fossils? China's neighbor, Nepal, has this area. It's the Monk Tanath Temple, and it boasts 108 dragon head fountains. Uh, we got to ask, is it just a coincidence that this one looks just like a Ceratopsian dinosaur? How would they know to make this unless they had seen one? Cambodia, not too far from Nepal and China. What's that creature look like carved into that stone? Doesn't that look like a, a stegosaurus? Any sixth grader would tell you, oh yeah, that's a stegosaurus. And this piece of art is part of an 800-year-old uh, temple in Cambodia, the, the, the Prom Temple. Carving is just one of many others depicting monkeys, deer, buffalo, lizards, parrots, animals that they would have seen on a daily, on a regular basis. And along with those animals, they depicted this one, which indicates this they saw on a regular basis as well. So how could they have known what a stegosaur looked like unless they had seen one? They had to have seen one, just like in all these other instances of people recreating images of dinosaurs. How could they have done that without having seen those animals? So what have we seen? Let's take a look. We've got ancient peoples over thousands of years from multiple cultures on several continents in varied mediums. In other words, they, they etched them, they, they used pottery to depict dinosaurs, they used statuary, they painted them, they engraved them, they carved them, they put them in their literature, all these different methods and more uh, they used to communicate the fact that they had seen and had experience with dinosaurs or dinosaur-like creatures. And they did it all with accurate detail. They've got repeat, repeated depictions of dinosaurs. How could that be possible in so many places and at so many times and in so many ways if they had not actually seen these great beasts? So, which conclusion makes more sense? Ancient peoples accidentally created accurate images of creatures long extinct? Or they saw the creatures and recreated what they saw. But hold on. Uh, we, we haven't come to the end of it yet. Soft tissue inside a T-Rex fossil. Could it be possible? Paleontologist Mary Schweitzer and her team were surprised to find soft tissues inside the femur bone of a Montana T-Rex that they discovered in 2003. This is from an msnbc.com article. It says, for more than a century, the study of dinosaurs has been limited to fossilized bones. Now researchers have recovered 70 million year old soft tissue, including what may be blood vessels and cells from a Tyrannosaurus rex. That's from the msnbc.com article, from March 2005, commenting on Mary's T-Rex bone. Schweitzer said that after removing the minerals from the specimen, the remaining tissues were soft and transparent and could be manipulated with instruments. How about that? The bone matrix was stretchy and flexible, she said. Also, there were long structures like blood vessels. What appeared to be individual cells were visible. Isn't that something? Here's what one other scientist is saying. John Horner from the Museum of the Rockies at Montana State University said the discovery is a fantastic specimen, but probably not unique. Other researchers might find similarly preserved soft tissues if they were to split open the bones that were in their collections. But I imagine most of them are reticent to do that. Nevertheless, this guy's saying it's probably not that unique. So, are we really being asked to believe that stretchy, flexible, transparent tissues from a T-Rex have survived 70 million years without disintegrating? How would they survive 70,000 years? Can you even imagine 70,000 years, much less 70 million years? Can you even imagine 7,000 years, just 7,000 years? How would they last 7,000 years? But we're not talking 7,000, we're not talking 70,000. We're being asked to believe that these tissues have survived as stretchy, flexible, and transparent for 70 million years, and they have not disintegrated or fossilized. What science would provide a definitive explanation for that kind of preservation? There really just isn't any. So which demands more faith regarding this particular find? 
that these tissues that are stretchy, flexible, and transparent really are 70 million years old, or that there is a more recent age for these remains. You have to draw the conclusion for yourself. We have been told over and over again that dinosaurs became extinct millions of years ago. We've been told that with such consistency and fervor, such dogmatism really, that we've come to accept it as science. But what does the word science mean? The word means knowledge. And what do we really know? What we know, what is real science is, that the abundance of evidence regarding the recent existence of dinosaurs leads us to conclude that a time frame of millions of years simply does not fit what we see. That's real science. That's real knowledge. I want to thank you for uh, sticking with us through this lesson. I want to invite you to come back for installment number two, which will be entitled Neanderthal and Company. We're going to look at some of the so-called missing links and what evidence there is and what's up with those guys. So see you then.